Welcome to UN Insider. I'm Elaine Reyes at the United Nations headquarters in New York. Join us as we delve into the world's most pressing issues and learn how the people inside work toward a better future for everyone around the world. Coming up on UN Insider. It's time to end this vicious circle of bloodshed, hatred and polarization. A violent conflict erupts in the Middle East. The UN condemning the brutality and working to address a major humanitarian crisis on the ground. The world is falling short of achieving gender equality and this becomes an ever increasingly distant goal. An uphill battle, a look at efforts to close the gender pay gap. Sounding a climate change alarm, warming temperatures, rapidly melting sea ice and glaciers around the world. Next on UN Insider. A crisis in the Middle East. It began with an unprecedented and unexpected attack. Saturday, Hamas militants launched a barrage of rockets into Israel. Hamas gunmen breached fences along the border with the Gaza Strip and began brutally killing hundreds of civilians and taking hostages into Gaza. The response from Israel came swiftly, declaring the country is at war and bombarded Gaza with airstrikes. Israel announced a full siege, cutting off electricity, water, food, and fuel. And military leaders promised a ground incursion into the densely populated Palestinian territory, massing forces along the border. Thousands have died on both sides, and the toll is rising as fighting rages. Just look at this photo of bodies of women strewn, strewn in the street. At the UN, Israel's ambassador shared graphic images from the terror attacks and pledged to bring those abducted back home. Israel suffered an unprecedented attack and the number of casualties is catastrophic, truly unfathomable. This is precisely why this atrocity is Israel's 9-11. From now, nothing will be as it was, I promise you. Today, we are shattering the paradigm. We are changing the equation. For 17 years since Israel unilaterally withdrew from Gaza, and since Hamas came to power, the world has tried to reason with these terrorists, barbaric terrorists. The UN is calling on both sides to stop attacks on civilians. It is calling on Hamas to release hostages and for the establishment of a humanitarian corridor into Gaza. The Palestinian ambassador also highlighted the desperate need for aid. We will continue the uh, contacts with everyone, including the Security Council, so that the international community to shoulder its responsibility in stepping to the, to the picture and in putting uh, it's an end to this onslaught against our people, but more importantly, that would require, of course, sending humanitarian assistance to the uh, 2 million.3 uh, of Palestinians who live in the Gaza Strip. Uh, it, there has to be uh, a humanitarian intervention in order to, uh, to avoid uh, a looming catastrophe. Beijing says Chinese nationals have been killed in the violence. The country is calling for an end to the fighting and a diplomatic resolution. China and Arab countries share positions on the Palestinian issue. Both sides called for a ceasefire and an end to the bombing. Both sides condemn actions against civilians to prevent the situation from escalating and causing a humanitarian disaster. We believe that the international community should play its role to provide humanitarian support to the Palestinian people and promote the resumption of peace talks as soon as possible. The U.N. Secretary General has spoken out on the conflict that has also claimed the lives of U.N. workers. Judaja has more on that. On Monday, a rather wary U.N. Secretary General, Mr. 
Antonio Guterres went to the briefing room and delivered his first in-person statement on the conflict. I've just concluded an extraordinary meeting of senior UN leaders to discuss the unprecedented developments in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory. Let me begin by repeating my utter condemnation of the abhorrent attacks by Hamas and others against Israeli towns and villages in the Gaza periphery. I recognize the legitimate grievances of the Palestinian people. But nothing can justify these acts of terror and the killing, maiming, and abduction of civilians. I reiterate my call to immediately cease these attacks and release all hostages. In the face of these unprecedented attacks, Israeli airstrikes have pounded Gaza. Medical equipment, food, fuel, and other humanitarian supplies are desperately needed, along with access for humanitarian personnel. Relief and entry of essential supplies into Gaza must be facilitated, and the UN will continue efforts to provide aid to respond to these needs. And I urge all sides and the relevant parties to allow United Nations access to deliver urgent humanitarian assistance to Palestinian civilians trapped and helpless in the Gaza Strip. And I appeal to the international community to mobilize immediate humanitarian support for this effort. The UN Special Coordinator and I are engaging with leaders in the region to express our concern, our outrage, and to advance efforts to avoid any spillover to the wider Middle East. This most recent violence does not come in a vacuum. The reality is that it grows out of a long-standing conflict with a 56-year-long occupation and no political end in sight. It's time to end this vicious circle of bloodshed, hatred, and polarization. Israel must see its legitimate needs for security materialized, and Palestinians must see a clear perspective for the establishment of their own state realized. Only a negotiated peace that fulfills the legitimate national aspirations of Palestinians and Israelis, together with their security alike, the long-held vision of a two-state solution in line with United Nations resolutions, international law, and previous agreements can bring long-term stability to the people of this land and the wider Middle East region. As the attention shifts from the original attack to the situation in Gaza Strip, in a very rare move, Secretary General Guterres again went to this briefing room and delivered his second statement in person. We must avoid spillover of the conflict. I am concerned about the recent exchange of fire along the Blue Line and recent reported attacks from southern Lebanon. I appeal to all parties and those who have an influence over those parties to avoid any further escalation and spillover. I call for the immediate release of all Israeli hostages held in Gaza. Civilians must be protected at all times. International humanitarian law must be respected and upheld. About 220,000 Palestinians are now sheltered in 92 UNRWA facilities across Gaza. UN premises and all hospitals, schools and clinics must never be targeted. UN staff are working around the clock to support the people of Gaza, and I deeply regret that some of my colleagues have already paid the ultimate price. Crucial life-saving supplies, including fuel, food and water must be allowed into Gaza. We need rapid and unimpeded humanitarian access now. According to the spokesperson so far, the Secretary General has talked with leaders in Israel, Palestine, Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, Qatar, Oman, Iran, Turkey. And the major efforts here the UN tries to do is to first persuade Hamas to release the detainees and second, to ensure humanitarian aids can access Gaza Strip amid a siege by Israel. And third, to contain the conflict and avoid a spillover, which to some degrees has already happened. Here's what I asked about the attacks on Syria's Damascus and Aleppo airports. The Syrian state media reported that Israel launched uh, 
missile strikes on the two main airport, which is uh, which are Damascus and Aleppo International Airports, and both are out of service. Can the UN local team con confirm this? Uh, yes, we've seen uh, we've seen these reports of of hits on on Aleppo and. Um, and Damascus airports, uh, which are extremely worrying, especially in light of the, of the the warnings and the concern of the Secretary General for an escalation uh, an escalation of the um, of of the tensions and the conflict uh, that we're we're seeing. We're, he's calling on all concerned uh, to avoid attacks that could harm civilians and damage civilian infrastructure. He strongly condemns all violence in Syria and urges all parties to respect their obligations under international law, recalling that civilians and civilian infrastructure must be protected under international humanitarian law. Uh, you know, I think the we're at a time where of these high tension where any uh, any any miscalculation I think could lead. Uh, to a uh, to a broader uh, to broader violence in an already volatile region, and I would also add um, that uh, the um, the fact that the airports uh, Aleppo and Damascus are not uh, are not functioning uh, that will have a temporary halt on the UN's humanitarian air service, which operates out of those both airports uh, to service uh, the Syrian humanitarian programs. The situation is still fluid on ground. We are still closely watching how the efforts we mentioned above could make a difference. Elaine. CGTN's Shidija, thanks. What role can the UN play amid the armed conflict? I spoke with Khalid Safori, president of the National Interest Foundation. Mr. Safori, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Can you talk to us a little bit about the role of the United Nations currently uh, with the conflict that's happening between Israel and Hamas? What kind of effectiveness could they have? It's important to note first that the only country in the world that was formed by UN resolution was Israel. Uh, and this is important because the pro-Israel crowd in America claimed that the UN is anti-Israel. In reality, the UN is a very good institution whenever the U.S. goes along because uh, frequently, especially when it comes to uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, the U.S. have the power to veto anything and paralyze the U.N. As we speak, uh, the U.N. Is, is saying that several of its aid workers have been killed in strikes, several of its uh, refugee agency buildings have been hit. Uh, they're asking for a humanitarian corridor to be established to get in aid. Is that possible? Nothing really is difficult, and it is possible if there are means to do it. The Egyptians, uh, Egyptian humanitarian agencies tried to send some trucks, and Israel warned them that they will bomb them. Well, it's important to note that the only access between Gaza and Egypt is the Rafah point, or access point, that was bombed from both sides by the Israelis, from the Palestinian side and the Egyptian side, they were bombed by war players two days ago. So uh, having this corridor, I think it's a great and noble idea. I think many people are caught in the crossfire, civilians that have nothing to do with Hamas, nothing to do with this war. And as a, as a matter of fact, many of them really were not born when Hamas came to power 18 years ago or, or more. But there is a growing humanitarian issue with some of the things that you just mentioned happen. How much longer do you think this conflict could go on? From past history, uh, I would not be surprised if this kept going for two months, maybe five months. Israel one time attacked Gaza for 54 days, I think in 212. And uh, uh, again, the U.S. is the real power that can stop them, didn't try to stop them at that time. So I don't think at this time they will try to stop them. So uh, this will be, I think, a, a long, a long battle. Mr. Safori, thank you for joining us. Coming up. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And this you can see year by year. And actually, it's just a matter of time. You win Insider. In a 
changes may appear to be identical, but looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. It has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better. CGTN. See the difference. The U.S. has had equal pay legislation on the books for decades, but the reality doesn't live up to the law. Women are often paid less than men for the same work. Nitsa Soledad Perez reports on the wage gap. Equal pay for equal value work. Sounds simple and fair, but still elusive in today's world. The world is falling short of achieving gender equality, and this becomes an ever increasingly distant goal. Recent setbacks, particularly affecting the lives of women and girls living in fragile or conflict-affected countries, along with uh, growing vulnerability due to human-induced climate change, are exacerbating this outlook. In the U.S., 2023 marks the 60th anniversary of the Equal Pay Act, a law mandating that women and men receive the same pay for the same work. Enforcement, however, has been the challenge. The U.S. ranks 43rd in the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Index. Latest U.S. government figures show women make an average 84 cents for every dollar paid to a man. And although this gender pay gap is the lowest it's ever been, progress has been slow and uneven across ethnicities, race and age divisions. A lot of it has to do also with the percentage of women in the labor force. It has to do with women having this role as caretakers where they are unfortunately forced either to stay at home or they go into the labor force, they're not making that much, and then they go home. And then when they go back into the labor force, they're still at that same level. So they don't actually go up. Many of those who achieve salary equality have had to fight hard for it. In 2019, U.S. women's national soccer team players filed a $67 million class action lawsuit, arguing their compensation was unfair compared to their male counterparts. After three years of litigation, the U.S. Soccer Federation agreed to settle the suit for $24 million and adopt a new collective bargaining structure that allows for women to be paid more. In 2018, it was revealed that Claire Foy, star of hit Netflix show The Crown, was paid significantly less than a male co-star. Producers only pledged to rectify the disparity in response to a public outcry. Women's groups in the U.S. are asking private companies to exercise pay transparency and for women to more aggressively confront disparities. That goes hand in hand with companies coming forward and saying this is what we're paying each employee and having that really clear and being able to have a conversation between um, your colleagues like how much are you making you know and having that be not so um, taboo. The wage disparity is even more significant for African-American and Latina women pointing to a deeper systemic issue of gender and race discrimination. Nitsa Soledad Perez, CGTN, Miami. The UN's weather agency is sounding an alarm over another consequence of climate change. Sea ice levels in Antarctica have fallen to record lows. This year's winter sea ice fell a million square kilometers below the previous record. Antarctic sea ice plays a critical role in regulating the Earth's climate. And the loss of sea ice could also have severe impacts on animal life. Antarctica isn't the only place dealing with the effects of ice melt. In Europe, the glaciers that have long been a part of the iconic Alps are retreating faster than anyone expected. Johannes Plushberger shows us the impact. Webcam images of Switzerland's Ron Glacier show the dramatic acceleration of the melting ice. In just two years, Swiss glacier volume has gone down as much as in the three whole decades before 1990. 
Smaller glaciers such as Sankt Anafirn completely vanished this summer and due to high temperatures and low snowfall, the Alps will be ice-free much sooner than expected. It's not only Switzerland that has seen an extreme glacier retreat this year. Neighboring Austria has experienced the same issue. And scientists here at Vienna's Geosphere Austria Agency are trying to understand the consequences this could have for Europe. So the consequences of the extreme glacier retreat um, are not uh, the water supply, because in Austria and also in the Alps, water supply is more dependent on the snow cover, on the seasonal snow cover. But of course, the landscape will transform. Skiing resorts in, on glaciers might also be affected because of infrastructure problems due to the glacier retreat. Austria's longest glacier, the Basterze, attracts about a million visitors per year. But there is less and less of it to see. Greilinger and her team are observing how the glacier is about to break into halves. This um, connection between the tongue and the upper part is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And this you can see year by year. And actually it's just a matter of time until this vanishes. And this is quite emotional on the one hand, because then the, the tongue is cut off from the feeding of the glacier more or less. But on the other hand, it's still amazing how much ice is there and the cracks. And it's still a nice environment to work in. Austria's Academy of Sciences warns that the country's glaciers will be gone by 2050, half a century earlier than previously expected. Johannes Blechberger, CGTN, Vienna. You win Insider. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. Migration is a growing trend around the world. More than 258 million people are living outside their countries of origin. In 2022, more than 108 million people worldwide were considered forcibly displaced. That's 19 million more than the previous year. There are more than 65,000 registered refugees in Brazil, and that total grows every year. Finding work can be a challenge for refugee and migrant populations. The Krista Franco introduces us to a program that offers refugees valuable opportunities and a chance to share a piece of their native culture. 33-year-old Iriana Romero left Venezuela four years ago. She now eases her homesickness with a cachapa, a typical Venezuelan corn pancake, at a refugee street fair that takes place once a month in Rio de Janeiro. I had to leave because of the ongoing crisis in my country, which is structural, economic and humanitarian. So I chose to move to Brazil, basically to have a better life. Today she's working as a full-time teacher at Abraço Cultural, or Cultural Hug in English, a non-profit refugee-led language school. She's one of the instructors from 18 different countries teaching Spanish, Arabic, French, and English. Lessons here are tailored to offer more than language skills to native Brazilians. They bring cultural elements of the teacher's home countries to dispel prejudices and encourage the sharing of experiences. Marco Antonio, a Rio de Janeiro native, for example, is in his second year of learning French and is enjoying being taught by his Moroccan refugee teacher. It generates awareness for us about the reality of Morocco and its migration issues, and I can see the variables within the language itself. Abraço Cultural was founded in 2015 and has branches in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. The main purpose of the organization is to generate income and empower refugees. 
In eight years, the school has paid over $1 million in salaries to refugees and vulnerable migrants. And since its inauguration, over 11,000 students in Brazil have signed up for its courses. Most importantly, I think, is that it promotes integration within the global south. All teachers go through pedagogy training offered by the NGO, which charges lower prices than other language schools. Most of its revenue comes from students, but it also relies on donations from public and private entities. While Iliana doesn't know if she will return to Venezuela anytime soon, she says she's happy with her life as a teacher and her unexpected role as a cultural diversity promoter. Lucrecia Franco, CGTN, Rio de Janeiro. I'm Elaine Reyes at UN headquarters in New York. Thanks for being a UN insider.